Hello, my name is Phil Eskew. I'm a DPC physician. Uh, much like <clears throat> that's the standard start to this conference. I'm going to try and be a little more entertaining so Chad's happy, hopefully. Um, I'm going to give you a quick overview of, of where we were, where we're at, where we're at now, and uh, then have kind of a Florida focus to things uh, as an example. So uh, as Jay mentioned, we got uh, laws in 23 states across the country, so we're almost at that halfway tipping point, but each of them have their own little idiosyncrasies. Uh, that's a bit of my background. You can find me at all those different places. And so for our discussion today, it's going to be a little more advanced. If your head is spinning, um, we'll, we'll go over some more details tomorrow. Most of the Medicare opt-out piece is, is really uh, saved for the discussion tomorrow. Uh, we'll go over insurance and HMO laws. Why are those annoying? Why do they get in the way? Why do they exist? Uh, dispensing issues. So most states across the country, it's perfectly fine for you to buy medications from Andamed's or anywhere else and dispense them, but there's a few that are uh, especially onerous and downright impossible in some cases. Um, pathology direct billing, which is an ironically titled law that got in our way, and then a couple uh, lab issues with more specifically New York and New Jersey. So 2014, we probably had a few more practices than this, but when I first started aggregating everything when I was a, uh, doing a visiting intern rotation at the Robert Graham Center, I uh, found 125 practices across the country. We've increased uh, year over year up to 290, 2015, 455, and 2016, and now we're just below 700. That was earlier this month. And you can see there are certain sp places that are especially popular. Uh, Colorado, Washington, Texas probably seem to have more practices than any other state. And Texas is an interesting one to me because they have one of the largest hurdles in that they can't pass through uh, dispensing savings. Uh, so when these first started, the first three practices I see documented all the time are Vic Wood out of West Virginia, Garrison Bliss in Washington, and Brian Forrest in North Carolina, although I'm sure there were others. Uh, Vic Wood was actually the first one to get the knock on his door from the insurance commissioner, and they said, you need to shut this thing down. We think you're taking on too much risk by treating all these uninsured patients with this monthly fee. What if they all showed up on the same day with the, with the worst case of flu known to mankind, and you couldn't possibly see all 200 of them? So. By himself, he went to the West Virginia legislature and lobbied about this, and they passed this narrow exception that put him in a box, and it was a terrible law. Uh, we corrected it this past year, but it used to say you can't market yourself to certain people, you can only charge certain prices we pre-approve, you have to register with us, and all these terrible things. Uh, Washington later passed a good law, and uh, Utah followed with a one-pager that was pretty good. Oregon, for some reason, followed West Virginia. 2014, we start to see a little bit more action. You can see the other colors there in purple. Uh, Lee Gross gets some credit for pushing things in Florida back then, even when there was less support from other states. 2015, um, we had a Montana governor who made one of the most ignorant comments about DPC I've ever seen, or he didn't support it for all the wrong reasons, but it was a bad bill, so we weren't too disappointed. Uh, then Virginia had a veto in 2016, but fortunately this year we came back and pushed again, and that's what it looks like now. So we got some corrections in Arkansas, corrections in West Virginia, <clears throat> and, and an educated Virginia governor who now passed it. Um, Montana unfortunately suffered the same fate. I pulled off some of the vetoes from this slide, and Pennsylvania, I guess their legislature likes to work weirder hours than everybody else because they still have a current session going on and they're talking DPC, but most other state legislatures are sort of cooled off at this point. So that's our win summary from 2017. I think it was a pretty good year. We're almost at a tipping point, and several of those were signed by uh, Democrat governors, uh, which is harder to do when there's only 10 or so of them around these days, but it's definitely bipartisan. So what, are, what did things look like in Florida? Well, Florida has an insurance code like every other state, and there's their definition of insurance for everybody to see. Contract whereby one undertakes to indemnify another to pay or allow a specified amount or determinable benefit upon determinable contingencies. So nice legalese there. Um, and then they explicitly excluded some prepaid service plans. So the point is, are you taking on risk or not, and who's a you know, whose opinion are you going to follow? We push for these laws not because they're necessarily required in every state, but because it clarifies the argument. It lets a new DPC physician reference something uh, ironclad and not have to deal with this investigation, not have to spend a lot of money up front, and not have to, quite frankly, have the state spend a lot of money investigating things. So in Florida, how do they define HMO? 
Uh, you can see that right there as well. So prepaid per capita or prepaid aggregate fixed sum basis provides either directly or through arrangements with other persons comprehensive health care services which subscribers are entitled to receive pursuant to a contract. So if you avoid the prepaid piece, you get yourself out from under the HMO pretty quickly. In Florida, it's, it's a nice uh, suggestion to also have some of that language in the bill. There are DPC practices across the state. That's sort of a zoom in of the mapper, and you can see a few of them there. And uh, what happened with the legislation when these practices pushed it, especially uh, with Lee's efforts this past year, it was HIS 15-02, and they defined DPC as something that met criteria in subsection 4, which we'll go over, and does not indemnify for services provided by a third party. What the heck does that mean? So that clause means they don't want you taking on risk that should be borne by other groups. More specifically, um, I've heard of some DPC practices that might occasionally have the dermatologist come through once a month and try to bundle that into their monthly fee and say, we're not going to charge you anymore because we've already we've paid this person to come in here. They're just going to see you that way. That's probably a no-no. Um, if you're trying to bundle in labs rather than pass them through with, you know, pass through the CMP at $4 and brag about it, um, don't try to bundle it into the monthly fee. You're going to get unwanted attention in several states that way. There's been a specific opinion in, from South Carolina saying that if you bundle the fees, they're going to be mad at you. Um, and then uh, the other thing you don't want to bundle is your medications. So if you avoid bundling those things, you should be good to go. Uh, primary care provider, which they fortunately defined in a broad, in a broad way, that's not problematic at all. They, they use the phrase commonly provided without referral or what we would call maybe an undifferentiated complaint. Uh, primary care service, also broadly defined, kind of mirrored after Washington and Louisiana there. And then they said the most important piece of legislation, direct primary care agreement is not insurance. So the reason Arizona was yellow on that chart is because they've got another clause that's, that basically castrates this entire phrase in their acts that, that, that sort of rendered it meaningless. So here in Florida, we had a strong uh, statement, and that's exactly the point of the legislation. And furthermore, they specified, unlike Oregon and a few other states that used to do this, we're not going to make you register on a list, pay a fee, be audited by the insurance commissioner, et cetera. And uh, this is more for your reference later. I can make these slides available to anybody who wants to see them who's from Florida. But these are the things you have to do to be defined as DPC in Florida. I bolded some of the most important ones there. You want to define the scope of what you cover. So some physicians get annoyed by this, but the truth is this is just good, this is just good business. You don't want a patient to come in expecting you to prescribe methadone when you don't do that. You don't want them to demand that you perform their cholecystectomy when you don't do that. So if you describe your scope, you make them happy and you avoid any complaints down the line. Uh, specify what your monthly fee is going to be and how to get it back if there's going to be some kind of refund provision, which ideally there should be. And of course, at the bottom, tell them up front, this is not insurance. That's your most obvious disclaimer, and a lot of the 23 states that have passed laws actually have a specific sentence that you have to put in your contract, sometimes in a specific place in the contract, just so that patients are appropriately informed. Um, unfortunately, even though I think Lee's been doing this every year since 2014, it's still not been passed here, so what's the M&M on Florida? Um, we had you know, a lot of committee support, and as Lee will tell you, it, it passed out of there initially, and then I believe the technique they used here, I've seen used in a few other states, they bundled it with some other things they didn't like, which gave them cover to vote it down. So try not to get yourself bundled. We've had the same thing happen in D.C. over and over and over because there are certain vehicles that Jay will tell you are about to be maybe something that's going to be moving, and we try to get added to it, and then there's confusion. We get pulled out because we can't be scored because of X, Y, Z. Hold people accountable, and the way you do that, in my opinion, is you have standalone legislation where they have to vote it up or down, and people can point at them and say, you did or didn't vote for this, and they won't have an excuse. Uh, so DPC state law comparisons, if you're in one of the states that doesn't have law on the books and you want to pursue it, these are the kinds of things you want to do. So these are the most important things to look out for. I've got a piece in the Journal of Legal Medicine that was recently published that specifies all this and looks at the states as they were in 2016. Unfortunately, the publication process is so long, it's just now out. So in-office dispensing, what's that look like now? Utah used to be a red state, for anybody that's a nerd about this, and it went yellow, which I'll explain in a minute. Other than that, we haven't had a whole lot of action. There were efforts in Texas to make the correction, but it didn't happen. 
So the states that are red, yellow, it's largely due to abuses that used to happen in the workers' comp sector several decades ago where people would uh, be charged really high prices at urgent cares and other places for prepackaged meds, and uh, those high prices weren't necessarily disclosed. So the pharmacy lobbied, and there you go. What happened in Utah? I don't know who was behind this. I can't um, take any credit or any blame for this. Um, I assume it was somebody who was DPC interested, but they didn't talk to me. I don't think they've talked to anybody else that I know of, so if, if, you're, if you're aware of it, I'd be happy to talk to you after the fact. But what they did out there was they carved out an exception for on-site clinics that really didn't help um, traditional DPC, but if you're on-site DPC, it's wonderful. So they said that you can get this license that will allow you to dispense cosmetic drugs, injectable weight loss drugs, or cancer medication, Okay, so I guess you can go to town with the methotrexate. Um, it's a technically a cancer drug, even though we're mostly treating psoriasis with that. Um, but then, if you're an on-site clinic, you can pretty much dispense anything like any other state. So for some reason, they, they passed this change and worded it that way. So in Utah, you've got a distinct advantage if you're on-site with a large employer that you wouldn't have otherwise. In terms of direct billing laws, um, the same thing was happening here that we saw with some, uh, some groups with pharmacy and the workers' comp space. Here you had uh, mostly dermatology practices that would bundle the pathology fee into the practice and they weren't necessarily reading the slide themselves. They were sending it off and then not disclosing the fact that they doubled the price and then charged the patient. So uh, lots of states passed what were called pathology direct billing laws, meaning the pathologist, whether they wanted to or not, had to directly bill the patient. If you're in a green state, that's not an issue. If you're in a yellow state, there's an anti-market provision, meaning you can go ahead and send them to cold diagnostics or whoever you want to use. You just have to disclose to the patient what the what cold diagnostics charged you and what your uh, charge. Or excuse me, in yellow, I'm going to back up. I just described the orange, which is disclosure. You got to tell them the price of the pathologist, and you got to tell them your price. If you're yellow, that means you got to tell them the price of the pathologist, and you can't mark it up, even if you wanted to charge a dollar for shipping or whatever kind of fee you wanted to add on there. And then if you're red, um, they're going to come after you if they figure out you're doing that. I just realized I need to update this because my next slide, Kansas is red there, but they're actually a green state now, at least for DPC docs. I think Josh Umber gets some credit for this. Um, so good job, Josh. <clears throat> and, and this past year, they passed House Bill 2027, which actually was a bundled bill that had all kinds of other provisions. But what we care about is DPC physicians is bolded here. So they said a physician that's providing services to a patient pursuant to a medical retainer agreement, which is how they define DPC there, and identifies the lab and the physician, along with the actual amount charged, um, and in, in, a, in a manner consistent with rules that we already have in place for appropriate billing, you can go ahead and charge the patient and not have to have it pass through. So that was good. Um, New York, where are we at there? Um, New York's one of the tougher states to do DPC. and. I, put a lot of work into describing a lot of those hurdles on, this, on that state page on DPC Frontier if you want an example of just how messy it can get. Um, but when it comes to labs in New York or New Jersey, we actually have trouble getting passed through pricing for those. And there are exceptions for all the wrong entities in all the wrong places. So we've got them exceptions for HMOs, exceptions for large hospital systems. And uh, weirdly enough, if you're trying to do a major uh, DPC enterprise in New York, I almost think that, that the group might try to use the HMO vehicle. Um, as a limited service HMO to try to get from out, out from under all these things and be able to dispense medications and be able to pass through labs at cost. So it's, it's kind of a weird situation there. But something to be aware of if you're in those two states. Um, <clears throat> here's a little bit of recommended reading. Um, there were lots of questions earlier about high tech, which I was going to try to save some for tomorrow, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention it now just in case we don't have time to get to it. Uh, the issue with high tech is that it allows you to demand from pretty much any specialist or hospital system that the patient can be offered a cash price. You can't say what that cash price is, of course, and neither can the patient, but they can say for privacy purposes, you are not to bill my insurance company, period, and full stop. There are some exceptions to that. High Tech, when it was passed, had a provision in it that said, to the extent this law conflicts with any other law, the other law wins. So they, they weaken themselves, unfortunately. Um, but 
Medicare saw that the high tech was being passed, so they carved out their own exception in Medicare language. So that works with any Medicare patient that wants to pursue it. It's going to work with any private insurance patient, because last time I checked, federal law trumps private contract. So that gets you an out there. It doesn't necessarily solve a problem with Medicaid patients, especially in states like Kentucky and uh, Colorado, where they've just said it doesn't matter what your Medicaid status is, enrolled, unenrolled, uh, what have you, there's just no private contracting with Medicaid patients. Um, a lot of the opt-out stuff I think we'll save for tomorrow, um, but the, the, the most common question I get there in case you're not here tomorrow, if you're contemplating DPC, should I opt out or not? If you want to moonlight somewhere else and you want to gradually do DPC and sort of feel it out, then don't opt out right away and build a wait list of Medicare patients that want to join you. Doing it any other way gets really complicated and legally quite expensive and risky. Um, if you're trying to operate a fee for non-covered service agree services agreement that you routinely see in concierge practices, then in order to defend that position, you need to start billing on a fee for service basis, which is something you're administratively probably no longer able to do.